Let's pray. Father, the thing that um, our hearts long for at this point as believers in Jesus is to see your face. Father, we're grateful for a life that we can live now by faith, that we can live under your word, but Lord, for there to be a day when faith will be turned into sight and the one that we love but have not seen, we finally see him, we see you, Jesus. That's what we want. All of the pains and the sorrows and sufferings of this life will be left on the other side of the shore and we will rest in those safe hands that we love. Lord, we would pray for your coming even today. Come, Lord Jesus. And in the meantime, Lord, instruct us with your word. Give us a, a fuller picture of who you are and what it means to be safe in your hands here by faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And you can take your Bibles and open them to Romans chapter 2 as we finish up that chapter this morning. Romans chapter 2, verse 25 is where we will be. You know, um, as Paul is unfolding the gospel in this letter to the Romans, one of the most important ministries of the gospel in your life, one of the most important achievements that the gospel will ever um, carry out in your life is finding where your false assurances lie and exposing them and eradicating them. Has that happened for you? Has the gospel found where any of your false assurances might lie, exposed them to you, and brought them down, eradicated them? This is what Paul is doing in his letter to the Romans. It, it, it is the gospel that he preaches everywhere he goes. He wrote it by the end of his third missionary journey. And he is systematically unfolding the entirety of the gospel in this letter. And, and he's also unfolding how he preached it when he went from one city to the next. You know this, gospel means good news. But the very first facts of the good news, the very first information or news of the good news actually is bad news. The gospel announces first Bad news about your life and my life. And what is that bad news? Well, in Romans chapter 1, it's that mankind, all of mankind, is unrighteous and under the wrath of God. In fact, it is so bad for mankind that if mankind is just left to himself that way, he will never find or create a path out from under his own unrighteousness or out from under God's wrath. Chapter 1, verse 32 is the proof text for that. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things like these, the unrighteousness listed above, they know that those who practice such things are worthy of a death sentence of judgment. They not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. They're all cheering each other on. That's what mankind does in their unrighteousness. It doesn't matter who you are in mankind, especially in the first century. It didn't matter if you were Roman, if you were Greek in culture, if you were called a Gentile by somebody or an Egyptian, an Assyrian, a Scythian, a barbarian. A... It didn't even matter if you were a Jew. Even the Jews were under their own unrighteousness and under the wrath of God. But Romans 2 then began with an imaginary protester to Paul's gospel argument. There's a kind of man that Paul met on his missionary journeys that didn't believe that Paul's bad news in the gospel was true about him. 
And what we found out to be true after 17 verses of chapter 2 is that the protester is, he's a Jew. If you bear the name Jew or if you call yourself a Jew. But he's a certain kind of Jew. A certain kind of Jew thinks he has nothing to worry about. His view of what it means to be a Jew exempts him from what the gospel has announced against him, that he's a sinner and that he's under condemnation from God. So then what Romans 2 ends up being all about is, is about how Paul, in his preaching of the gospel, helped Jews like this protester see that even Jews are unrighteous sinners and under the wrath of God, and that this so-called Jew's view of Jewishness, listen, doesn't get him out from underneath his own unrighteousness. It doesn't get him out from under the wrath of God. His view of Jewishness didn't match the gospel's view of him. And what about you? Does your view of yourself match the gospel's view of you? Who cares what your assessment of yourself is if it's not in agreement with what the gospel says? And so before Paul can actually get to the good news of salvation by grace through faith alone, in chapter 3, verse 21, Paul deals with this special class of Jew. Not every Jew was this way, but he deals with this special class of Jew to establish that he is actually truly under sin this one in Romans chapter 2 that Paul is addressing, though he may be a self-restyled and self-redefined Jew, this one, even through his own self-definition, he truly does have something to worry about, even though he thinks he doesn't, regarding sin and judgment. This certain kind of Jew has two false assurances in particular, and Paul is tracking those down. The first false assurance we saw was that he possesses law. And the second is that he is circumcised as a Jew. In regards to his external possession of law, Romans 2 has been slowly but steadily building the case that his possession of law is only superficial. It's just an external possession of law. He's within the boundaries of law, and that's it. In other words, his possession of law made no inward effect upon him. His heart had not been arrested yet by the will of God re revealed through the commandments of God where he would actually want to live and be pleasing to, to God. The reality is this Jewish hypocritical moralist, as we've been calling him, is only a massive transgressor of law, the very law he claims to possess. And that right there is the proof that he is under sin. He is truly unrighteous. And what this Jewish hypocritical moralist doesn't understand is that his second false assurance rests on his obedience to the first, to the law. If the outward possession of law was a false assurance, then, then his circumcision also was meaningless. Why? Because what is external circumcision of the flesh that was commanded by law if the Jew wasn't living by that very law anyway. A massive transgressor of the law, this man, is going to take assurance in the only thing by law that someone else did for him when he was eight days old. This is Paul's aim as a gospel preacher, is to chase this man into his last two strongholds his false assurances, and pull them down over the top of them. The result is, by the end of this chapter and into chapter 3, verse 20, the Jewish hypocritical moralist will be fully exposed before the gospel's bad news, that all of mankind, both Jew and Gentile, are under sin and doomed. Let me read verses 17 to 29 for you in chapter 2. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon law and boast in God, and if you know his will and if you approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and if you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you, therefore, who teach another, 
Do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice law. But if you are a transgressor of law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of law, will not his circumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who through having the letter and circumcision are a transgressor of law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Well, what is this last section of Romans chapter 2 all about? That's what we've been saying. It's There's two false assurances of the Jewish hypocritical moralist, and they are eradicated because they had no inward effect on the man. Last time we saw the law of the Jewish hypocritical moralist, that was the first false assurance he had, and Paul took it away from him. The second one today, the circumcision of the Jewish hypocritical moralist, is also a false assurance. Now, let's just focus in on the second false assurance today. And the topic of circumcision in verse 25 to 29 and its place in the life of the Jews is probably not a topic fresh on your mind. So let me take us back to God's priorities for the Israelites. Let's go back and let's think, what did God prioritize for Israelites? This is Old Testament foundational truth. What was God's first priority? Circumcision of the heart, of the heart. Circumcision means a cutting away. Now, in this case, it's not a cutting away of flesh, but it is a cutting away of who the Jew was inwardly before God. You see, something was deeply wrong with the Israelites, and the call of God to the Israelites was to take care of that problem at the inner man level, who he was inwardly before God. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10 for just a moment. You must see this. This is foundational for the Jew, for the Israelites. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Listen to what Moses exhorted Israel with. Now Israel, verse 12 of chapter 10. Yahweh your God, what does he require from you? What are his priorities? To fear Yahweh, your God. To walk in all his ways and love him and to serve Yahweh, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. To keep Yahweh's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today for your good. Behold, to Yahweh your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. He is so exalted and transcendent. Yet, on your fathers did Yahweh set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples as it is this day. So, what? Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. For Yahweh your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality, nor does he take a bribe. And that is exactly what Paul has been saying in Romans chapter 2. He's impartial. He's not going to cut you a favor. Circumcise your heart. This is the priority. The good news for the Jew then that he could look forward to as he came to this realization. How does he do this? How does he circumcise his own heart? How does he cut away what he has become sinfully inside before God? The 
promise from God in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. I'll read it to you. You listen. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. This is the highest priority of God for the Israelites. And this was what Jesus was trying to get at with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that you must be born again by the Spirit. In God's mind, this was the most important priority of all for the Israelites. It was foundational. And woven into this was the grace reality of justification by faith alone. Believing and having that faith in God counted as righteousness by God. And therefore, inseparable from that became the second priority, which was submission to God's law. Why would God cut out your inner self, who you were sin, uh, sinfully before God, and then have you not Keep his requirements out of love for him. They're inseparable. Flowing inseparably from circumcision of the heart was a softness of heart to live under God's will and have a desire to please him by living under his, lo uh, his law, um, to walk in all of his ways, Deuteronomy 10, to keep his commandments, to fear him, to love him. And then there was the third priority for the Israelite people. Circumcision of the flesh. That was the outward sign in the flesh that was to point to the other two inward, inseparable realities. A circumcised heart and heart submission to the law of God. Circumcision was established back in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10 with Abraham, if you'll remember. So those are God's priorities. This is, these are the things that matter the most. Circumcised heart leads to submission to God's law, which is evidenced outwardly by circumcision in the flesh. There was just one problem, though. One big challenge for the Israelite was that God's priorities didn't match life's practical reversal of those realities. Because what happened practically in life? What happened in real time for the Jew? Number one, what? On the eighth day of his life, he was circumcised in the flesh without any inward realities present. A Jew possessed outwardly the sign that was supposed to point to the inward greater realities and priorities of a circumcised heart and submission to law. He had the sign externally before there were ever any inward realities. And as that young Jew grew up, he was put within the boundaries of law. Number two, submission to God's law. And we'll put submission in quotations for now. The family, the nation, put that young Jew within the boundaries of God's law and trained him to live within it and live under it, to live in possession of it and have it possess him. The best case scenario, though, for a Jew, the best case scenario would be that the Jew discovered that he couldn't obey it. I can't. In fact, when I look truthfully deep inside me, I don't want to. Something was wrong deep within and he would have to cry out to God from the heart for his own heart to change. God's call to the Jew was then, well, then circumcise your heart. And he would say, how do I do that? And God would respond, I will circumcise your heart. And woven inseparably with that is the cry of the Jew, faith faith alone, and God would declare that Jew righteous on the basis of that faith alone, and therefore, number three, finally, circumcision of heart would be there. This was the cutting away, again, not of external flesh, but of the inward sinful self. This is what, uh, what it meant to be born again, and now from this point forward, um, submission to God's law was actually possible in sanctification, and the external circumcision finally had the inward realities present that it all pointed to from the outside. Now numbers one and two have value. Now let's go back to Romans chapter two. But something horribly happened among some Israelites. There is the perversion of God's priorities by some Israelites, not all of them. 
Number one, what happened in this perversion of God's priorities? There was circumcision of the flesh. And this one, in his perversion, was content without any inward realities. He would say effectively, take the external sign as, a, as automatic proof of these internal realities. No need to doubt my covenant membership and my covenant privileges. I myself, I call myself a Jew, chapter 2, verse 17. And if this is the case, that man just put himself in a realm where he doesn't need repentance. He's okay. Nothing to see here in regards to sin. Only non-Jews or uncircumcised need to repent and believe. He also only had, number two, mere possession of God's law. He didn't have submission to God's law. And that's been proven in this Jewish hypocritical moralist uh, all throughout chapter two, that he, he only takes God's law and he turns it on others. He's weaponized with the law to turn it on others. He has no intent to apply it to himself. And what did all of that point to inwardly for him? He had an uncircumcised heart. And Paul has actually already said that. Look at chapter 2, verse 5 in Romans. But because of your stubbornness and what? Unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. This one has not been changed inwardly. He has not been born again. He does not want to be. And therefore, justification by faith alone is not even on his mind. He's not interested. It's a non-essential to him. He's circumcised. He's a Jew, as he defines Jewishness. And this is precisely the Jewish man that Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 2. And for this Jewish hypocritical moralist, his, his false assurances need to be pulled down. So Paul pulled down his external possession of law, and now in verses 25 to 29, he's going to pull down circumcision as well. We're going to break down Paul's argument into three parts this morning. First, notice with me, the validity of outward circumcision. There is a validity to outward circumcision with obedience. As a part of the explanation from above in verses 17 to 24, Paul says that external circumcision is of value. Verse 25, for indeed, circumcision is of value, meaning it actually has profit. There actually is worth in it. It's valid. What God commands, he puts value in when it is carried out the way he designed it to be carried out. Outward circumcision is a valid priority when done as God intended. This is Paul's argument so far in tearing down the Jewish hypocritical moralist's false assurance in his circumcision by defending valid circumcision as God designed it. Paul will demonstrate how the Jewish hypocritical moralist doesn't have it. What makes circumcision have value? Well, you could say, because God just commanded it, therefore it has value. But the problem with that is the Jewish hypocritical moralist would, would agree and think that he himself is in alignment with that because he has it. But Paul doesn't tie circumcision's value there. Paul ties the validity of circumcision to something that this Jewish hypocritical moralist does not have. What doesn't he have? Obedience to the law. Circumcision, verse 25, is of value if you practice law. Now, I'm going to take you back to God's priority so that you don't do something funny in your mind here. What is God's priority? Circumcision of the heart, which led inseparably to what? Submission to God's law in sanctification. One led to the other. It's the only way to get to obedience to the law is through a changed heart. And then the outward sign of circumcision of the flesh made sense. And even if the reversal of life's priorities got them there the, the backwards way, circumcised first, I can't obey the law, I need a changed heart, God changes the heart, and now there is submission to the law and the sign means something. Either way, in both cases, outward circumcision is inseparably tied to obedience to God's law through a circumcised heart. This Jewish hypocritical moralist doesn't have that submission to law in sanctification. And that helps determine, uh, that's the only way that there's value in circumcision. Let me take you back to the outline here. For a, a Jew to, real, to rely on circumcision, but not be interested in obeying the law, 
to living a life pleasing to God, which is revealed through keeping the requirements of the law, that's about as upside down to God's intentions as could be. And so Paul takes this Jewish hypocritical moralist in a territory that he never imagined himself to be in. Look at verse 25. But if you are a transgressor of law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And he would be saying, what? What did you just call me? He's been a transgressor of law. That's been the whole case of chapter two. His life choice was to be a trespasser of God's law. That Paul is not saying here that occasionally, once in a while, this Jew had lapses of judgment with God's law. That's not what he's saying. What he means is, you practice the same things that these other ones glory in in chapter one, verse 32. You practice the same things. Verse eight, you're selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth. Verse nine, you're the one who does evil. Verse 12, you are a sinner under law. Verse 21, you teach everybody else, but you're not teaching yourself. Verse 23, you boast in law, but through your breaking it, you dishonor God. That's Paul's whole point. That's what Paul means by this guy is a transgressor of law. He puts himself within the boundaries of law, but only to turn it on others, not himself. And if he is indeed this way, here's what Paul says, your circumcision is invalid. But even worse, it's no different than uncircumcision. So did you catch this? Paul actually just called this Jewish hypocritical moralist uncircumcised, which would have been a huge slam against him because valid circumcision depends on something he doesn't have, genuine submission to God's law that comes through a circumcised heart and in sanctification. It's been proven extensively that he's a transgressor of law, and so any claim he has to outward circumcision means absolutely nothing. It counts as much as uncircumcision. And as if that weren't shocking enough, Paul will show how much obedience to the law in God's design through a circumcised heart actually devastates this man. Because think of this, what if an outwardly uncircumcised man actually kept the requirements of the law through circumcision of heart. Look at verse 26. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded, counted as, reckoned as circumcision? What does Paul say? It will be. It'll be counted as circumcision. Well, how? How is that possible? When he's circumcised of heart already, and is living in submission to God's requirements in the law through sanctification. And the New Testament actually is full of countless examples like this. They were called Gentile proselytes. You came across them all the time in Acts. Gentiles who actually were God-fearers, they believed Yahweh. They just didn't know that Yahweh had come in the flesh yet, and his name was Jesus. And Paul and the others kept preaching him to him. Paul is not teaching salvation by works. This is a judgment context. He's showing this disobedient, sinful, transgressing, self-styled Jew that his outward circumcision is a false assurance, and he gets at it through his disobedience. And so Paul's going to make a big deal about biblical obedience, True obedience, the only kind of obedience that matters, which is that which comes from a circumcised heart. And that totally condemns this Jewish hypocritical moralist. Isn't this true, that God would look more favorably upon a Gentile, though uncircumcised in his flesh, but who is circumcised of heart and striving for submission to God's law and sanctification? Would God not favor that man more than this Jewish hypocritical moralist who is circumcised, but only in his flesh? And he's not interested at all in submitting his life to God's law? 
Paul's language is interesting in verse 26. Will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Uh, as circumcision? It means want to be reckoned to his account as valid circumcision, even though he wasn't circumcised in his flesh. So what a slam on this Jewish hypocritical moralist. His jaw must have dropped to the floor and then fallen down a whole flight of stairs. But don't worry, there's a shovel at the bottom and he needs to dig a deeper hole and get down lower yet. He doesn't have valid circumcision because he's disobedient to the law. And then Paul just goes and calls him uncircumcised. And then Paul tells him an uncircumcised man is pra who's practicing God's law and sanctification is actually counted as circumcised. Something he doesn't actually have. Validly have. Paul shows this Jewish hypocritical moralist that he still needs to fall a little lower. Notice with me, secondly, number two, the verdict against outward circumcision. There's a verdict against this outward circumcision. The first one showed the validity of outward circumcision. There was a way in which it was valid according to God's plan. Now there's a verdict against this outward circumcision, and it's a verdict against a circumcision without obedience. Without obedience. Because circumcision without obedience is nothing, and there's a verdict against it. But who delivers the verdict is the interesting thing. Look at verse 27. Who delivers it? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law the way that God establishes the law to be kept, will he not judge you who, though having the letter and circumcision, are a transgressor of law? Did you see what Paul just did for this guy in this chapter? He just came full circle back around on him. In chapter 2, verse 1, he said, you who passes judgment... He said, you judge another in verse 1. He said it again, you who judge. He said in verse 3, you pass judgment on those who practice such things. In verse 19, he says, you can judge every, everyone to be in these different categories. You're blind, you're in darkness, you're foolish, and you're immature. This is how that man judges. But don't worry, the Jewish hypocritical moralist says, I can be your guide and I can be your light. And I can be your corrector, and I can be your instructor. The hypocritical moralist, he is the judge in his mind. But Paul just turned it all upside down on him. This circumcised man is in no position to judge anyone. But this uncircumcised man, who is obedient in all the ways that God says to be obedient is in a better position of judging. In fact, he will even judge the Jewish hypocritical moralist. A circumcised man being judged by a man with only credited circumcision. That would have just blown this guy's mind away. What assurance can this Jewish hypocritical moralist actually have in his outward circumcision? And did you see how Paul takes one last shot at his external possession of law? Look at verse 27. You, who, though having the letter. Notice what Paul didn't say. He didn't say, you have the law. He has said that in this chapter so far, but now he won't even say that. Why? Because he really doesn't have law. He has letters. Just letters. This is not a compliment, it is a criticism. Paul is saying, y you have a letter. I'm not even willing to call it law anymore that you possess. I, I think it's similar to what we mean when we say, those are just words on a page to you. What do we mean when we say that? The intent of those words doesn't mean anything to you. They're just words on a page. You just, those are just words and that is the reality for this Jewish hypocritical moralist. He claims to have law, but law is nothing but letters to him. And they're just words on a page. The point, again, is for this man, you need to understand this. This is so dangerous. To be an unrepentant sinner like this man is, in adding law to life with hopes that you won't be judged, does you absolutely no good. Even something good like God's law, in that case, just becomes words on a page. Just letters. 
The sinful man is in no condition or position to stand as a judge over others with mere letters on a page. In fact, just the opposite is the case. An uncircumcised man for whom the law is his joy to show his love for Yahweh, that man will judge the Jewish hypocritical moralist. So Paul has pulled down nearly all of this false assurance by showing he is under the judgment of an obedient but outwardly uncircumcised man. But there's still yet one brick to pull down on his head that's tied to his circumcision, and it's how his name as a Jew is tied with it. So we saw the validity of outward circumcision when it's accompanied with obedience, and then we just saw the verdict against outward circumcision when it has disobedience with it, and now Paul extols the virtue of inward circumcision of the heart. Why in verse 28 and 29 is Paul concerned about defining who the real Jew is not and who the real Jew is? Verse 28, for he is not a Jew. Verse 29, for he is a Jew. Why is Paul concerned about defining who the real Jew is and isn't? For only one reason contextually, what is it? That he named himself a Jew in verse 17, right? Really? You're a Jew because you say you are. Is it really that simple? Is true Jewishness for an Israelite established merely because you just call yourself one? Who gets to define which Israelite is truly a Jew? God does. And it comes through inward circumcision of heart. Verse 28, he starts with, who a Jew is not. He is not a Jew. Who? He who is one outwardly, meaning as evidenced by merely possessing law and merely having external circumcision. He goes on, verse 28, circumcision is not that which is outward in the flesh. And you might say, well, but wait a minute, it, it actually is though, right? I mean, the Jews were commanded to do this external, outward circumcision, right? I mean, you remember what happened to Moses when he was on his way to Egypt and he didn't circumcise his son. God met him to kill him. It matters, right? When it's done the right way. The twisting of this circumcision leads Paul back, pulls him back from... Um, speaking of it this way and speaking of it in this way, so much like how God did with sacrifices. Let me take you back and, and, and remind you of this. Remember how God commanded the Israelites to offer sacrifices, right? Burnt offerings, and the burnt offerings were to him in heaven a soothing aroma, delightful to him. Those sacrifices were. Of course, always in his mind, God was pointing to the greatest sacrifice and the greatest shedding of blood to come in his son, but the reckless way that the Israelites brought even their lame sacrifices, their blemished animals, led God to say at one point, I take no delight in sacrifices. The very God who commanded them and said they are a soothing aroma to me, he says, I take no delight in the way that you're bringing them. And I think something similar happened with circumcision. Yes, circumcision was an outward religious procedure that God prescribed for the Jews. But their twisting of it, their perversion of it, leads Paul to say, that's not what circumcision is merely about. This self-named Jew isn't a true Jew because of his distorted circumcision that misses what outward circumcision was to point to inwardly in the heart. And so if this Jewish hypocritical moralist isn't truly a Jew when he calls himself one, then which Israelite is a true Jew? And Paul does something amazing in verse 29. Do you know what he does in this really dark judgment context? He lets a crack of salvation light come peering through into the dungeon. It's amazing. Look at verse 29. He 
He is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. He describes this salvation light in Old Testament terms. He is a Jew who? The one who is one inwardly. What do you mean, Paul? That he has circumcision of the heart. Remember, the heart is who a man is inwardly before God. It is not a piece of you. It is not a portion of you. It is who the man is inwardly entirely before God. And the circumcision here, therefore, is not the cutting away of external flesh, but it is the cutting away, the removal of who the Israelite sinfully was before God. And this is what that Jewish hypocritical moralist needed the most because he was stubborn, verse 5, and had an unrepentant heart. That inward work on the heart, it can never be done by a mere external possession of law. That's no different than having mere letters on a page. This is a circumcision of the heart that is not by the letter verse 29, because that kind of possession of law makes no impact on the heart whatsoever. The inner man, the inner heart remains stubbornly stiff. How did that inner change of heart occur for the Israelite? Remember, God said, I will circumcise your heart. How did it happen? It was achieved, verse 29, by the Spirit. Achieved by the Spirit. This is the new birth that Jesus was stunned to discover that the teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, didn't know, didn't get. The leadership of Israel instructing Israel doesn't even know and think about being born again, doesn't even think about circumcision of heart. The priority on God's heart and his mind for the Jews, for the Israelites, was that. And a teacher of Israel couldn't even unfold it. being born again. That's not a New Testament doctrine. It's a Bible doctrine, all Bible doctrine. It's an Old Testament and Newer Testament doctrine. And in massive contrast to the Jewish hypocritical moralist, this true Jew is the one to be praised. Do you see that? His praise, this one who is circumcised of the heart by the Spirit, his praise isn't from men, it's from God. The God who saved him delights in him. Is that amazing? Delights in him to the point of actually praising him. And all sorts of contrasts would have been rushing through this Jewish hypocritical moralist mind at this point. Um, He lived on how others viewed him. He lived to be praised by others. Didn't Jesus address this with his disciples in his Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be praised by them. Paula hints at that here, that his praise is not from men. Slam on you, Jewish hypocritical moralist, because that's the only thing you're concerned with. Someone would say to this Jewish hypocritical moralist, wow, you're a guide to the blind. And he would say, oh, did you, did you notice that? What light for those who are in darkness you are. You think so? What a corrector of the foolish and a teacher of the immature. You saw that, huh? He lived for this. What mattered to him more than anything was to be praised, but by the wrong audience. He lived before the wrong set of eyes. Is that easy to do or what? That's not a Jewish problem, is it? That's a human problem. He was completely unaware that God saw him as one under judgment, chapter 2, verse 5. 
was completely unaware that God would render to him according to what he had done. He was completely unaware, verse 11, that God was impartial and wouldn't cut him any favors. He was completely unaware that he had dishonored God in verse 23. He was completely unaware that he was the cause of others blaspheming God. But you know what? As long as the praise from man kept coming, he wasn't even concerned. There's something there for us for sure. As we finish chapter two, can I maybe draw a couple of points of implication for us? Religious practice can keep you from seeing yourself as you truly are before God. Religious practice can keep you from seeing yourself as you truly are before God. That was certainly the case with this Jewish hypocritical moralist. You must see yourself and examine yourself. In fact, you need to rediscover yourself over and over and over through the gospel's assessment of you, the gospel's assessment of you. And that is exactly what Paul is doing in these early chapters of Romans as he unfolds the, the depth and the riches of the gospel. The first thing he's doing is he's establishing sin and guilt and wrath. And if all a religious person does, though, is only look at his or her religious practices and nothing else, that one can miss what the gospel says is true foundationally under him or her. And, and just like the Jewish hypocritical moralist was self-deceived about his own sin, you and I can draw false comforts and false assurances in external religious practices if that's all that we look at and evaluate ourselves by. So listen, I mean, we said this last week. This isn't a Jewish problem. He didn't do this because he was a Jew. He did this because he was a human and he happened to be a Jew. And you and I do the same because we're human. It's a part of our fallenness. What we need regularly is the gospel announcing to us its first bad news. that we are all under sin, and that we are all under judgment. I am, and you are. We all are. Religious practice can keep you from seeing yourself as you truly are before God. Don't just look at what you do or what you don't do. Let the gospel tell you who you truly are foundationally. Secondly, as sinners, adding even Christian rules, I know we're not Jews who lived 2,000 years ago under Mosaic law, but as sinners, adding even Christian rules and regulations will not help you escape judgment as a sinner. You see, that was the principal strategy of this Jewish hypocritical moralist. He, he thought he was going to escape judgment by merely possessing some kind of religious law. And Paul's conclusion for him was devastating. Do you see that? And the worst thing that you could conclude is, well, that's what happened with Jews. Jews did that. Again, it's not a Jewish problem. It's a human problem. Even Christian Churches can do this, and it can happen in our midst. The same conclusion exists for even the sinner today who thinks adding a Christian version of rules to a life of disobedience before God will actually prevent judgment. You see, where Paul is leading us is to faith alone in the person and the work of Christ, of Jesus. He's leading us to God crediting to your account his righteousness, but only 
only on the basis of faith alone. There's where your assurance is. Not in adding rules to your life if you think things aren't going the way they're supposed to be going in your life. Paul's taking us to grace, to faith, to credited righteousness. So as sinners, adding even Christian rules or regulations won't help you escape judgment. And then maybe if I can take those two things together and pull them together for the kids in our church. You, young ones, the ones who'd be sitting in here would be junior high and high school, maybe some younger ones. You are being raised from your earliest days in a setting where Christian rules and commands of the New Testament are all around you. Your mom and dad and this church put you in the middle of it. You possess law. And Romans chapter 2 should be, um, should probably disturb you a little bit, unsettle you, of how dangerous that situation can be. That's very, very similar, what you were in to what the Jewish hypocritical moralist was in. And so beware of how he thought and beware of what he did. He did it not because he was a Jew. He did it because he was a fallen sinner and so are you. So listen, kids, do not, let's think about a couple things that he was really good at. Don't draw any comfort and don't draw any any assurance in being able to quickly see what is sinful in others. Maybe it's your parents. You can just see it like that. Your siblings, your classmates, other kids in student ministries. Man, you can just see it like that. Take no assurance in that. Draw no comfort from that at all. Because that was the Jewish hypocritical moralist. Had everybody divided up into their categories. You're blind, you're in darkness, and you're a fool, and you're immature. I can't find anybody in a good spot like me. And I am the solution. Take no assurance there. <coughs> Draw no comfort in your ability to be the guide to the blind or the light for the one who is in darkness or the corrector of the one who's really acting foolishly. Take no comfort in being able to instruct the, the immature because God has put in those things no salvation comfort. Do you understand that? Paul tore all of that down on top of the Jewish hypocritical moralist. Has the gospel led you to have your false assurances be brought down yet? So where is your hope then? Your hope is inwardly at the heart. Not what you have there or what you bring to the table, but what God is willing to do there at the heart. To use Old Testament terms, to circumcise it to cut away your sinful self inwardly before God. He does that by his spirit. Another way to talk about it in both testaments is to be born again, to be born again. Paul called it being a new creation. If any man or woman or boy or girl is in Christ, he is a new creature. How do you get there? By coming to the end of yourself and crying out to God to save you. And you, you may have law all around you. You may be able to tell accurately so how unbelievers are living or how Christians are living foolish lives. You may be, who cares? But how do you find hope is by coming to God and crying out to him to change you at the heart level. And what you will find inseparable from that 
is a cry of faith to him. I believe Jesus. Believe his finished work at the cross. Believe in his person, what he did, who he is. Trust in him and in him alone. And God credits to you his righteousness on the basis of that faith alone. Today, even today, let the gospel, whether you're young or old, let the gospel expose any false assurance you have and let the gospel eradicate it and lead you to new birth in Christ and salvation by faith and by grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel. Though the first thing it would speak to us in meeting us is bad news concerning us, Lord, may we not shun it or push it away even today. Lord, I pray for any young ones here who maybe are feeling the sting of your gospel, Lord. Let them see the truth of the bad news and lead them to where true assurance is and where true hope is and comfort is in being transformed by your spirit, being born again from above. Father, would you grant to them in that newness, grant to them the cry of faith. Take these old familiar truths that they've heard about since they were kids, they read about in the Bible story books their moms and dad read to them. Lord, bring a freshness and a, a sharpness. May they, may they cut and penetrate in ways maybe that they never have. Lord, we plead with you for them. Do for them what mom and dad can't do and what an older sister or a younger brother can't do. You do it, God. Save them. Take away the false assurances. Grant them true assurance and comfort in Christ alone. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.